My name is Evert Agneholm, and as said, I come from DNVGL. Uh, maybe quite a lot of you don't know what about DNVGL, but uh, it is uh, the former Gutia Power that I was one of the founder of. So three years ago, we went to DNVGL when we were bought by um, DNVGL. Um, I'm working as a consultant there. Uh, I have my PhD studies from Chalmers, so I've been working quite a lot with uh, power system restoration historically, uh, frequency control, voltage control, and as Andrea said, I have been involved in this uh, uh, development of the new requirements. So I think I'm one of those who have been working most <laughs> with this. I was with from the start. We had three months find the, power, uh, the frequency oscillations in the power system, fix it. Now it's quite many years later and uh, we have a lot of challenges left. So it's not always that easy. Um, during the project I have been responsible as project leaders, but I have also been working quite a lot with tests. We have also been doing tests uh, in other projects, not this FCP project that we have been working with. So I will show you some experiences from the tests, and I will try to highlight some of the findings that we have. So, first of all, in order to test, you need to have a test equipment. So I will go through a little bit about the test equipment that we have, sorry. Ah. I will talk about the tests that we have performed, experiences that we have gained. It's from hydro unit, gas turbines, and thermal units. I will highlight two different parts here that we have found during the test. Of course, it's much more <laughs> that we have found, but two things that I think is of importance to highlight. And that is the governor feedback signal that we have in the turbine governor and the importance of that one. And then I will also highlight another thing that is the backlash that we experience everywhere. And don't make things linear as we, as we would like it to be. I will talk a little bit about how to tune and optimize. And I will have one slide also to show a little bit nice thing that we found out in the FCP project. Or nice, I don't think it's nice, but it's, uh, it's something that can be worthwhile thinking about. And then a short summary. Uh, the test equipment that we have developed, or that we have, is uh, a test equipment that replaces the normal frequency signal, or the speed signal that we have to the turbine governor. So thereby we can feed with a simulated signal, and we can study the response of the turbine and the turbine governor. How can it move? I don't press. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, it's also adopted to be able to test the new FCR requirements. It is small and portable. It can be connected during operation, so you don't need to shut down the production unit. Of course, you can do it if you want, shut down and, and connect. But it's also possible to connect it directly. If looking at the turbine, turbine governors that we have, there is a huge amount of different turbine governors requiring a different type of signals for the frequency signal that we want to inject. So there we have a flexibility, and we are still developing new when we <laughs> discover new signal times that we need to have. What we also use this equipment for is to test island operation capability. And that is when we have a one or a few number of units running in island operation to make sure that the frequency stability is maintained. But basically, it is the same thing as looking at the whole power system, looking at uh, island operation. And as I said, can be used for FCR verification. Um, here we have a little bit more. It's a uh, test equipment that is based on general and flexible uh, platform, national instruments, programmed in LabVIEW. We can have a high frequen uh, sampling fre uh, frequency, up to 50 kilohertz, but normally <laughs> we are not interested in such high sampling, but we have the flexibility. Now it works again. We have here different type of outputs, 
plus minus 10 volt DC, milliamps or 110 volt AC. But we have an amplifier also connected so we can basically uh, have any signal type that we want. And as I said, we are still developing new type of signals. So here, it is a normal laptop and here we have this one. Current clamps for connecting to the current transformers and we connect to the voltage transformer. So we measure the current and voltages and calculate the power without delays. We had this, uh, the hardware, and then we had the uh, test equipment. So we have done, actually, here we had this challenge we, when we were in Myanmar. It was a very old governor, uh, mechanical. <laughs> uh, but we have, as I said, performed tests on a number of hydro units, 10, 20, 30 hydro units, uh, several gas turbines, and also thermal units, as I said. And it has been to verify the FCR, island operation capability, and voltage control. If looking at one of the important things when, when we have a unit, it's the governor and the feedback signal. And there are uh, quite a lot of different ways to do it. It can be that we have the guide vane feedback. It can be that we have the regulator output as feedback signal. And it can be that we have the active power as feedback signal, or maybe a combination of different types as well. And the governor feedback signal, it has quite a big impact on the unit response that we can see. It has on the stability margins, but also if we go into the details of the requirements and the testing procedure, it has an impact of the test signal that we need to apply if we, for instance, have active power as feedback signal. One example of the importance is to look at the hydro unit. This is a Pelton turbine that we have tested. We have tested the gain when applying a frequency step. And then we have seen the steady state activation. And then we have this megawatt per hertz that we can calculate. And what is important when having guide vein feedback, as we have here, is that we will not have a constant megawatt per hertz. Even though we apply the same step, it has a very big variation in active power. So, according to the old requirements that we had, if I should do a test, I would do it here. Then I would earn four times as much money as I did it here. So it's important, the new test requirements that Andreas has spoken about, that it also will consider these type of things. Otherwise, you had a quite a good flexibility as a producer. You could earn four times much, as much money, depending on where you applied the test. Generally, when looking at uh, hydropower, the gain, the megawatt per hertz, or regleerstyrk, as we say in Sweden, decreases with the loading for Pelton and Francis turbines, where it is, it is the opposite for Kaplan turbines. If we are using the guide vein as feedback signal, if we use active power as feedback signal, we will have a constant megawatt per hertz. This is an example from a thermal turbine using active power feedback. And here we have the relationship between the valve opening, regulator output, and active power. And it's not the same, so it varies. And normally the, the manufacturer try to have a linearization in order to cover up this. But it can also be that you're not 100% successful in your, in your linearization. So, here is an example from a thermal turbine that has a constant megawatt per hertz since it's using the active power as feedback signal. So the red one here is active power. And here we see the different valve opening and also regulator output. And it is in 
percent here to, to, to the right. So you can see very clearly that it's not linear. The other thing that is of importance that I said I wanted to highlight is backlash. Now this is a test from Myanmar, where we have tested seven different hydro units. We perform a step in frequency, the blue one, and then up. If we shouldn't have any backlash, the power increase that we could see here, delta P1, should be exactly equal to delta P2. We can see here, it's quite a big difference. And it's also when going in the other direction. And this is a typical example of backlash. And here we are using guide vane as feedback signal and not active power. If we are using active power, it will steady state be the same. Backlash. What is backlash? We have it almost everywhere. But the easiest thing to understand the backlash is if we look at these tooth. If we have a distance here, that we can say is a backlash. We can also look, if we simulate a backlash, we have a sine wave as input signal, and this is the output signal. So here, the green one is the input signal, and then depending on how much backlash we have, we have the red and the blue signal. And what can we see? The amplitude is affected. So the more backlash we get, the less amplitude we, we get out. But it also has a significant impact on the phase shift, as we can see here. So here, if we look at the fundamental component, it will be delayed. And phase shift is not good for the frequency control. Backlash, also here for a gas turbine. We can see here the active power after a, the same step as we talked about before. And we can see here the heat flow that is in this case the regulator output and the input to the valve. So here it is several percent the backlash. And what does backlash then mean? What impact does it have on a power system? This is on an island system that we test. Here we apply a step change in active power that is the green one, and as a response we have the blue frequency. And then we apply a step change in load again, and we get the frequency. What we can see here is that we get oscillation, or limit cycles. So the frequency oscillates here with roughly plus minus 0 0.3 hertz. We have a period time of these oscillations that are roughly 20 seconds. So this is a typical example of the impact of backlash. We can also look at this of the stability and these oscillations when doing the sign-in, sign-out tests. And then we look at the border plot of the system. And that is here. And then we can see the phase and amplitude margins that we have. And we can see that here we have applied different amplitudes of the sign-in, sign-out. So the higher ampl amplitude that we have of the sign-in, sign-out, the less impact we will have of the backlash. But if we have a small amplitude, we will get nothing out from the unit. This is of very big importance when looking at island operation and not to have these oscillations. But basically it's the same if we are studying it from a whole power system consisting of many, many production units. So, tune the frequency control to fulfill the FCRI requirements. There are many different production units that are taking part, and that uh, there are quite a lot of things in the production unit that can have an impact on the ability to fulfill the requirements. So, 
it's very important before doing the test to have a knowledge of how it works. So we suggest that you put up a model of your unit, a physical model, try to find out the parameter settings that you have, and if possible, also validate the model. And before doing the tests, perform simulations. So actually you perform the test sequences that are prescribed in the, in the FCR requirements. Then you get a knowledge and then you basically understand what can I expect when I do the test. And then you can also very easily tune in a simulation model. And the easiest way is of course to tune the governor because it's just software. Other things can be much more difficult to, <laughs> to tune. So it's very, very important to do this part. Then you perform the tests. And when you perform the test, if you haven't validated the model before, you get, you get data for validation. So you can tune your model to see that it fits better. So here we have an example from a test where we applied a step signal. We have the blue one, that is the active power, measured during the test, and the red one is from the simulation model. And it doesn't fit perfect, but it's rather good. But it can be possible also to tune this one. So, measure and evaluate the tests. If fulfilling the requirements, it's okay. You can start and go to Andreas to say, now I have fulfilled the requirements, so I can start to sell this product. But if not fulfilling it, you need to do it in an iterative process to find a way to fulfill it. When you have fulfilled it, Andreas wants you to be here, in the middle. But is it optimal from your point of view? Yeah? You can be anywhere in this circle and you still fulfill the requirements. So, from the producer point of view, it's like my son. I ask him, what would you like to do in future? I want to have a job where I do as little as possible and earn as much as possible. So that is basically what the producers would like to do. They would like to do as little as possible and earn as much as possible. Whereas Andreas, he wants you to be there. That's from the power system point of view, the best thing. So, it's important to have a good knowledge of your production units in order to see if you're going to participate with frequency control, what is it that costs for you? So you need to be able to categorize this. It can be reduced power production due to allocating capacity. That, of course, is something important. It can be the efficiency that is reduced, operating at another load level. And it can also be these things that are a little bit more complicated to see wear and tear that we always have, and how does that contribute to the costs. So, by having different, you have your model, you simulate in a model, you can have the typical frequency behavior that you have during a day, during a week, during the year, and you can see how this impacts your production unit if running in different uh, modes and in different parameter settings. And now, from the nuclear power, you haven't supplied much of frequency control. You normally have power control in the, in the nuclear power. So when we had the FCP project, we had some discussion with one of the production units. How does it work? You have power control. And historically, it's no big use of having a fast power control. But then you get new products in, and we can make this fast. It was made fast in some unit. Very fast, exactly. So what happened when it worked in power control? As Andreas explained, we can have quite big frequency derivatives in the system when tripping a production unit. What is happening then? Well, we take from the kinetic energy of the unit. We measure the electric power. What is happening if we produce more power since we are delivering the kinetic energy, we have the power control. 
reduce the mechanical power. Is that good for the power system point of view? No, it's very, very contraproductive. So you shouldn't have it like that. So it's very important to really know everything that you're doing in a production unit when doing changes, how it affects also the power system. <laughs> so, summary. It's important to have a good knowledge of the production unit and its limitation before starting to see if you should supply FCR or not. Sometimes it's rather easy to see that it will probably be very difficult to fulfill the requirements. Of course you can continue, and I as consultant can of course <laughs> assist you, but in some cases it's useless. You will not be able to fulfill the requirements. As I said, to build up a dynamic model of your unit is very fruitful. You get good understanding and you get an understanding how to tune in different ways. Because being in the station, of course, you can do it continuously, but it takes time there and it's more costly as compared to sitting at the computer and do the simulations. When you test and measure, you normally discover quite a lot of things. <laughs> and one of the things that you normally discover is that everything is not linear. So it's not as your idealized model. So, I think all, during all the tests that we have performed, there has been a need to optimize also when being in the power station, based on the findings that we have. And what we also have found is that all units are individuals, so even though you have tested one there and you have a twin, it can be different behavior. So it's very important to do all tests of all unit. As I said also in the end, you can create further values by optimizing it, so it's, it is done in a good way from your perspective. Yeah? That's what I plan to say. Well, thank you very much, Emil, for this really interesting presentation. Give an applause. We have time for questions. I see one over there. Thank you. Um, Peiyuan from Chalmers. Yep. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you say power control for nuclear, yep. uh, is that a PI control or is it uh, just a P control? Uh, I don't remember exactly how it worked, but it, w it was looking at the active power production and then it measured and then it looked at the set point value and when you had a difference, it started to regulate. So uh. you get in the same. So the, 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 uh, what I wanted to say here that it was very fast now, it's no intention to be fast and what it worked was really in the opposite way because yes. It basically measured also the change of the kinetic energy. Yeah, and then it sort of regulated the mechanical power down. Yeah, so, so from a power system point of view, it's t totally uh, a catastrophe, or what to say. <laughs> it, it doesn't work in the right way. Okay, a quick second question. Is the, um, when you talk about the tuning for the governor for, uh, let's say, for the hydro turbines, yep. is it important to take into account the, the frequency dependence of the load? in the system. That is taken care of by the requirements. So that is not included in the test procedure. That is covered in the requirements. Because if you have a multiple, because if you have like multiple units regulating at the same time, yep. and then the frequency dependence of the load will also providing yep. a what, what, what we know is that we have a frequency dependency and uh, that it's reducing. <laughs> So we have a clarification here for the okay. <laughs> load dependency. Essentially, um, the model that I showed that you have for frequency stability, you need reserves, you need system inertia, you need, you've got disturbances. In the system inertia, that's actually, it's the overall system that is to be controlled by the resources. So that's in that system, you have both inertia and you have the load frequency dependency. But uh, there are providers that are fairly good at s selling frequency controlling equipment. Uh, HVDs are essentially ABBs 
good at delivering. So future system, future light systems will probably not have that much load frequency dependency in the end. So it will be a very poorly damped uh, freewheel that we have to control in the end. If looking at fans and pumps today, they are normally run by adjustable speed drives. So from a system perspective, the frequency dependence will be zero. Okay, no, there was some question here. Or any more questions for Evet? Or do you feel okay? Well, thank you very much, Evet. Yeah, um, thank you. For a really good presentation and making more practical, how can we introduce new actors to our frequency control markets?